Honduras. Introduction. Honduras has been a transit point for narcotics coming to the United States since the late 1970s. Its relatively sparse population, large number of remote dirt airstrips, long coastline, and unpoliced bay islands make it an attractive stopover point halfway between Colombia and the United States. Colombian marijuana smugglers have used Honduran waters to transfer loads from motherships to smaller boats headed for the United States. Colombian cocaine traffickers have used Honduran airstrips for refueling and transshipment of cocaine heading north. In addition, two large recent cocaine seizures demonstrate that Honduras is being used to repackage narcotics to avoid detection as the drugs come across the U.S. border. In 1987, customs officials seized 2,268 kilograms of cocaine in a shipment of Honduran plantains and 3,629 kilos in a shipment of Honduran furniture. There is evidence that individuals in the Honduran military, which controls the police, have protected the cocaine trade. The military has dominated the elected civilian government since democracy was presumably restored in 1981. The Honduran military has consistently supported U.S. policies in Central America, most notably the Contra War. Honduras has received large amounts of U.S. assistance. In 1986, Honduras was the eighth largest recipient of U.S. foreign assistance, receiving $189 million in loans and grants. The peak year for USA to Honduras was 1985, when the country received $289.1 million, of which $73.9 million was in military assistance. History of Narcotics Trafficking in Honduras Members of the Honduran military leadership became involved with gun running and smuggling through their relationship with then Colonel Noriega. According to Jose Blandon, Colonel Noriega used his relationship with military intelligence counterparts throughout Central America to protect his arms dealings and his entry into the drug trade. His counterpart in Honduras, the head of the Honduran military intelligence in the late 1970s and early 80s, was Colonel Torres Arias. Jose Blandon testified that Noriega drew Torres Arias and a close associate of his, Colonel Bowden, the commander of an armored division, into the business of supplying weapons to the FMLN rebels in El Salvador. Several weapons flights from Noriega to the FMLN in Salvador went through Honduran territory and were protected by Torres Arias and Bowden. When Blandon was asked whether he personally knew that weapons were being shipped through Honduras to the rebels in El Salvador, he responded, Of course. He went on to testify, quote, Noriega coordinated meetings in Panama with the directorate of the Ferrabundo Marti Front to establish two routes for the supply of arms to El Salvador, one through the Gulf of Fonseca and another in the north of Honduras called the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Did you attend any of those meetings? Answer, I attended both meetings, end quote. In 1983, Noriega arranged two meetings between Torres Arias, Bowden, and the FMLN rebels. Noriega wanted to have Fidel Castro introduce Torres Arias and Bowden to the FMLN leadership in order to facilitate the development of a direct relationship. To conceal Havana as their real destination, Torres Arias and Bowden said they were traveling to visit Noriega in Panama. They went to Panama, but were then flown to Havana in a Panamanian military jet for secret meetings with Castro and the FMLN. When the word of the trips to Havana began to circulate among the Honduran military leadership, Noriega passed the details back to the CIA. News of the trips caused a scandal which led to the dismissal of both Torres Arias and Bowden from the Honduran military. Landon testified that by 1981, the relationship between Noriega and Torres Arias had expanded into narcotics trafficking. Landon also testified that he had indications that the network of clandestine airstrips in Honduras, which was being used to supply the Honduran-based Contras, were being used by drug planes. 
Honduran coastal waters also have been used to transfer marijuana from mother ships to smaller shrimp boats for runs to the United States. Convicted smuggler Lee Rich testified that he had cargoes of marijuana transferred from Colombian motherships to their shrimp boats in Honduran waters. Rich testified that the shrimp boat they used looked exactly like the ones the Hondurans used and blended in with the Honduran fleet. The Colombian motherships offloaded the marijuana to the shrimp boats at night, and the shrimp boats would then head back to the United States. Convicted trafficker Michael Vogel testified that his smuggling group was offered the same offloading use of Honduran waters. While Vogel testified that he never personally used Honduras, he was aware of a group working out of Honduras in conjunction with the Honduran military. Rich's and Vogel's account of using Honduran waters for the transshipment of marijuana was confirmed by Tomas Zepeda, the agent who opened the first DEA office in Honduras in 1981. Zepeda, in a subcommittee deposition, stated that Honduran waters were being used for transshipment to a considerable degree. He went on to say that such transshipments were protected by the military. When the DEA would ask the Honduran Navy to intercept the smugglers' boats, Zepeda said they, Honduran naval officers, would, quote, stall for time, identifying a number of problems, lack of fuel, the boat would be unable to operate. And frequently, I would have to go into headquarters and request authorization to buy fuel for the patrol boats so we could go out on an operation. It was usually after the fact when we got out in the patrol area. End quote. Zepeda also said that he had received information that Torres Arias was involved in the drug trade and that he had passed the information on to Washington. According to Zepeda, when Torres Arias was replaced by General Gustavo Alvarez, the corruption at senior levels of the armed forces continued. Zepeda said that he filed extensive reports on the corruption of the military by the drug traffickers and that the corruption made his work in Honduras difficult. Quote, It was difficult to conduct an investigation and expect the Honduran authorities to assist in arrests when it was them we were trying to investigate, end quote, he explained. Without consulting Zepeda, the DEA office in Honduras was closed in June of 1983 for budgetary reasons. Zepeda said that if he had been asked, he would have argued that the office should have stayed in operation. He said that even though there had not been many arrests, the office had generated a substantial amount of useful intelligence. When the office closed, Zepeda was sent to the Guatemala City DEA office, where he continued to spend 70% of his time dealing with the Honduran drug problem. Zepeda testified that the drug problem in Guatemala was less severe than the one in Honduras. Boiso Rosa, Lachinian and Narco-Terrorism on October 28, 1984, the FBI seized a shipment of 345 kilos of cocaine worth an estimated $40 million on a rural airstrip in South Florida. The proceeds from the sale of cocaine were to have been used to finance a plot to assassinate Honduran President Roberto Suazo Cordoba. Arrested in the plot were General Jose Boiso Rosa, who was at the time the Honduran military attaché in Santiago, Chile, Gerard Lachinian, a Honduran arms dealer living in Miami, and Faiz Sikafi, a Honduran businessman also living in Miami. All were charged with conspiracy to commit murder. At the time of the arrests, FBI Director William Webster stated, quote, We don't want international terrorists to establish beachheads or bases for operations in the United States, such as they have enjoyed for years in other parts of the world. End quote. Factual admissions by the United States in the trial of Oliver North, released publicly on April 6, 1989, revealed that, quote, In mid September 1986, Lieutenant Colonel North advised Admiral Poindexter that U.S. Ambassador Negropont, General Gorman of South Com, senior CIA official Dwayne Claridge, 
and Lieutenant Colonel North had worked out arrangements for support of the Contra resistance with General Boiso Rosa, a former Honduran military officer who had recently been convicted of offenses in the U.S. Lieutenant Colonel North suggested that efforts be made on Boiso Rosa's behalf to deter him from disclosing details of these covert activities. Boiso Rosa was subsequently extradited from Chile to the United States. While Lechenian was convicted by a federal jury on conspiracy charges and sentenced to 30 years in prison, Boiso Rosa was treated very leniently. He was sentenced to five years at Eglin Air Force Base Federal Prison Camp in Florida, after senior U.S. government officials attempted to intercede on his behalf since, quote, he had been a friend to the U.S., involved in helping us with the Contras, end quote. The Justice Department had objected strenuously to the lenient treatment accorded Boiso Rosa, arguing that the conspiracy was the, quote, most significant case of narco-terrorism yet discovered, end quote. On November 21, 1987, Jorge Ochoa was arrested on a highway in Colombia driving a $70,000 Porsche owned by Saeed Spear, a Honduran colonel serving as a military attaché in Bogota. Saeed Spear denied knowing Ochoa and said that his use of the car was unauthorized, but he could not explain how he was able to purchase such an expensive car on the pay of a Honduran colonel. On November 19, 1987, a week after authorities in Florida confiscated the largest seizure of drugs ever in the United States, 8,000 pounds of cocaine, which had been packed in hollow furniture in a Honduran factory, DEA announced plans to reopen its Honduran office. Ramon Mata Ballesteros In March 1985, DEA agent Enrique Camarena was kidnapped and brutally murdered in Mexico. Camarena had been investigating the activities of Ramon Mata Ballesteros, and Miguel Felix Gallardo at the time of his kidnapping. Both Ballesteros and Gallardo were believed to have been partners in a large cocaine smuggling organization which worked through Mexico to the United States. Following Camarena's murder, DEA began an intensive search for Mata. Mata was born in Honduras and grew up in an environment of extreme poverty and illiteracy. As a young man, he obtained a false visa and moved to the United States. He was eventually captured by immigration officials and deported. He returned to the United States, where he was sentenced to five years at a minimum security prison in Florida. After serving three and one-half years of his sentence, he bribed his way out of prison and fled to Mexico, where he joined a drug smuggling ring. He rose through the ranks to become one of the top people in the smuggling organization at the time DEA agent Camarena began his inquiry. DEA tracked Mata to Cartagena, Colombia, where he was arrested and set for extradition. The Medellin cartel planned an escape from the La Picota prison in Bogota, but the warden, Alcides Aramendi, blocked their plans. In revenge, the cartel murdered Aramendi while his car was stalled in Bogota traffic. The cartel's second attempt at rescuing Mata was successful. They paid $2 million in bribes to the prison guards, and Mata walked out of jail and flew to Tegucigalpa. Once back in Honduras, he surrendered to authorities on outstanding murder charges. He was subsequently found innocent and resumed a normal life. He believed that he was safe from extradition to the United States because the Honduran Constitution forbids the extradition of Honduran nationals. Mata, who had been characterized by U.S. customs officials as a Class I DEA violator, quickly became one of Tegucigalpa's leading citizens. He helped establish an airline company, Setco, which, among other services, provided cargo transport services for Contras based in Honduras. He took up residence on a large estate and began giving money to the poor. At the same time, U.S. law enforcement officials believed that he began running his cocaine smuggling operation from Tegucigalpa. 
their suspicions about his activities increased as the result of two large seizures of cocaine from Honduras in South Florida. The seizures, which totaled more than 5,000 kilos, were both concealed in containers shipped from Honduras to the United States. In addition, convicted smuggler Michael Vogel stated that in the course of his drug trafficking and looking into the possibility of trafficking through Honduras, he was informed that an individual named Mata was the cartel's point man in Honduras specifically and Central America generally, and that to engage in any narcotics activity in Honduras, one had to have his cooperation. Despite his connection to the Camarena murder and his widely suspected drug dealing, the United States did not pressure the Honduran government to take steps to expel him from the country or curb his activities until April 1988. On April 5, 1988, the military arrested him and expelled him from the country by putting him on a plane to the Dominican Republic. Upon arrival in the Dominican Republic, he was put on a plane to Miami with American authorities who arrested him as soon as the plane was in American airspace. The arrest occurred on the eve of Zepeda's scheduled testimony before the subcommittee. Rigoberto Regalada Lara On May 16, 1988, the Honduran ambassador to Panama was ordered held without bond in Miami after U.S. customs agents found nearly 26 pounds of cocaine in his luggage. The ambassador, Rigoberto Regalada Lara, a retired Honduran army colonel and stepbrother of the Honduran Armed Forces Commander-in-Chief, had been ambassador to Panama since 1986. In response to the arrest, the Honduran government notified U.S. authorities that Regalado's diplomatic immunity had been suspended, allowing Regalado to be prosecuted under the laws of the United States. Regalado had arrived at Miami International Airport from Tegucigalpa on a TAN Airlines flight on May 15th. A customs inspector checking his luggage found the cocaine inside 10 packages surrounded by coffee and wrapped in plastic concealed inside pant legs and other clothing in his suitcase. Policy Issues A review of the history of gun running and drug trafficking through Honduras suggests that elements of the Honduran military were involved in the shipment of weapons to the FMLN in El Salvador and in the protection of drug traffickers from 1980 on. These activities were reported to appropriate U.S. government officials throughout the period. Instead of moving decisively to close down the drug trafficking by stepping up the DEA presence in the country and using the foreign assistance the United States was extending to the Hondurans as a lever, the United States closed the DEA office in Tegucigalpa and appears to have ignored the issue. Little public attention was focused on the presence of Mata Ballesteros in the country until the February 1988 New York Times article. Moreover, as previously noted, when a former Honduran military officer who has assisted the United States in the Contra War against Nicaragua became involved in a narco-terrorist plot to kill the elected president of Honduras, high officials of the U.S. government interceded in an effort to get his sentence reduced. Denying weapons to the FMLN was a major U.S. policy objective in the early 1980s. It was so important that it became a central issue in United States-Nicaraguan relations and became a justification for various U.S.-supported actions against the Sandinistas. As in the case of Panama, it appears that a compelling factor in United States-Honduran relations was support for American policy in the region, especially support for the Contra War. As long as the Honduran government provided that support, the other issues were of secondary importance. This is Our Hidden History.